we made this workshop in order to share our thought process from the designer and developer's perspective, hence the title, A Dev Designer's Perspective on Crafting Data Stories. So to begin, we'll start with a quick introduction of ourselves. So for you guys who didn't join us in yesterday's main talk, we are from Continentalist and it's a mouthful. So usually we'll just call ourselves Conti for short. We're a data and editorial studio based in Singapore, dedicated to help people understand Asia through data. So usually we focus more on the Southeast Asian region where we're from. So places like Singapore, Malaysia, Philippines, around that area. So our work uh, hopes to cut through the noise by bridging research and public. You can see our little logo there, how it transforms from like a tortoise to a bridge. And we've been around for about five years now. And we've been honing our skills and expertise in data storytelling. So in essence, we turn research like this on the left. It's a research paper on the Belt and Road Initiative into a data story that is dynamic, not static at all, with um, visuals like maps and text boxes. Our founding mission has always been grounded in social impact, so we don't just do these stories to add more information that's already out there. Rather, we craft these stories with uh, the intention to clarify complex topics and spotlight important matters to hopefully drive people to take action or making change. These are some of the stories that we've told. I'm not sure whether those in the back can see, but if you check out our website, we have a few categories such as climate change, social justice, culture, people, um, and we've been doing this for quite a while now, so we hope to create some change in this kind of sectors. Lah. Now that I've introduced Continentalist as a company, we are your speakers for today. My name is Aisha. I'm the front-end tech lead for Continentalist, and I code the bespoke stories as well as client projects that you see on our website. Over there, I have Amanda. She's a UX architect, and she works on story designs, data visualizations, and client projects. Okay, now that we've introduced ourselves, we'll start off with like a poll activity because we do want to get to know you guys too in the room and those of you at home. Okay, we're going to use Slido. And so we're going to be scanning a lot of QR codes in like this session. Okay, so like get your phones ready. Join us in Slido. We have the event code Conti. Tell us more about yourself. Are you um, here because you have no experience in creating data stories? You are creating your own data stories or you're still learning how to do so. So we get like, um, we know who we're talking to in this room. We can see how many people are actually in the poll. So do whip up your phones and join us. Thank you so much. Let's give it like a few seconds for people to join us in Slido. So if you can't scan, if you can't scan the QR code, you can also head over to slido.com and put in the event code conti K O N T I to access the questions. Thank you so much, 18 people who has who has participated in a short poll. Great. It seems like we have a mix like bag of people in this room and also back at home. But most of us are already creating data stories on our own. I hope that we can add something, we can give you some inspiration or, you know, add on to your repertoire of what you already know with this um, workshop. Okay, great. Thank you so much, everybody, for participating in this short Slido activity. Here's a quick rundown of what, we're, what we have planned for today. We'll be sharing with you a couple of um, tips and tricks about data storytelling. So the meat of what we're going to go through is about layout and reading experience, visual design, and data visualization. Right, so... Just to clarify, I know this um, whole data fest, we've been talking a lot about data visualization, um, and I'm sure all of you have been attending a lot of data viz workshops so far, but here at Conti, um, we talk more about data stories. So data visualization is like a subset of what data storytelling really is about. So um, if we're not too focused on data visualization, just hang tight to the end and we'll reach there. Okay, 
And just a few matters before we start, we've also prepared a cheat sheet for you, which contains like the key principles that we'll be talking about. So for those of you at home who don't have the physical copy, no worries, we got you. Just scan the QR code and you'll get an editable PDF where you can take notes and, you know, just um, follow us through as we walk through the key points for today's presentation. So for those of you in class, we printed like 30 copies, but because we weren't sure how many people are joining us. Um, but yeah, if you look around the class, there's physical copies all around. Okay, now that all the front matter has been get, uh, we got over the front matter and all the all the stuff. Uh, we're super excited to kickstart this interactive workshop. So, let's go. First one, data storytelling. So we always start with a definition first. So here at Conti, we define data storytelling as the ability to communicate insights from data using narratives and visualizations. So the stories that you encounter out there can be really simple or can be really complex, but the underlying ingredient to us is always the same. We want to tell story around the data rather than using data to complement an already thought out story. So how do we create a data story in Conti? Anyone in our team can pitch and conceptualize an idea, but it takes at least uh, three people to craft a data story, usually one from each of these disciplines. So the editorial team will take care of the narrative and the writing, the design team will look after the wireframing and the designing of assets, and the dev team will take over um, the development of the story in terms of code, front-end development, and we push it to life for other people to see. So it's a highly collaborative process because we all have to communicate closely with each other on things like design decisions, how the story should flow, what ideas you want to tell in your story, as well as like limitations in terms of web development, how mobile considerations would um, affect the experience of the readers reading your story. So this is a process of crafting a story. It's a four-step process. I know it looks wordy here, but don't worry. We'll go through in depth with an example later. But generally, where the designer and developer comes in is at the start here when the draft comes, when the draft is approved. So somebody in the team will pitch a story, say they want to write about like global warming or climate change in a certain country and it's approved. We get an outline of how the story looks like. And then Amanda will go ahead and conceptualize the wireframe. The wireframe is a basic skeleton of what the story can potentially look like. And she uses Figma to draw it up. And then the third step, we apply visual design, where we think about like mood boards that would influence the concept of the story, where you choose your color palettes. And at the last step, we do data visualization design. Okay, to exemplify this process, we would be walking through a recent story that Amanda and I worked on, which is called The State of Asian Science Fiction in Southeast Asia. Okay, well, hello, can you, is this working? Yes. Okay, so, um, sorry, Aisha, where's the click off? <laughs> sorry, okay. Um, so for this walkthrough, we will just be focusing on the first two steps, which is the reading of the draft and coming up with the reading experience. For steps three and four, which is visual design and data visualizations, we will cover that in the later half of the workshop. So in case you're curious, this is the story we're talking about. You can scan the QR code if you are curious about it. You can read it in your own time. So the first step is always read the draft. So this draft, um, it's a very important document because not only can you get a sense of the mood and tone of the story, it is also very practical in telling you how long the story is. So from here, you need to get an idea of how to best design the story in order to not overwhelm your reader. And so for the science fiction story, we realized that the author wanted to talk about science fiction in different Southeast Asia, and the story was very text heavy. So we had to find ways to break the content down into more digestible bits. So keeping this in mind, we move on to step two, which is to imagine the reading experience. So for me, I think it's especially nice if the reading experience can correlate to the topic we're talking about. So for example, for science fiction, I was thinking about ways we could 
um, enable the reader to experience this story in a science fiction way. So, for example, um, you know how in Marvel movies, when Iron Man does all these gestures and things start moving and it looks really futuristic? So I was thinking of ways to incorporate that. And through some light research, I realized that gestures are very important in science fiction. And these were some gestures that I wanted to play around with for the story. So things like waving, pushing, swiping. And then, so once you get an idea of the reading experience you want, you we move on to step three, which is to draft it up. So for this draft, um, I came up with a few ideas of how I wanted to incorporate those gestures in. So in the top example, I was thinking about an air vent thing where if you click on the icon, the air vent will open and reveal the content. And for the second one, because there were so many chapters for each Southeast Asian country, I was thinking, what if we could like do a swipe to unlock and then the next chapter will appear. And then for the third one, um, it's like a knob that you can turn to make your decisions. So I drafted all these out. But at Continentalist, because we are creating so many stories, there's always this challenge of balancing creativity and innovative, uh, creativity and innovation and practicality, which is the time and effort needed to create something. So when Aisha and I discussed this story, we realized that most of these interactions were very um, superficial and aesthetic, and it didn't really add to the content itself. So we had to figure out alternatives to still maintain this level of sci-fi-ness while not um, adding too much extra load of work to for the developers. Mm -hmm. So this brings up to step four, which is to iterate, iterate, and iterate. So in this stage, the challenge was to um, solve the problems in step three, which was the practicality issues. And after a while, we realized that um, to maintain that level of sci-fi-ness, all we needed was interaction and movement. But that interaction doesn't have to be intertwined with the input of the user. So we didn't need the user to actually swipe or pinch or move things around. We just needed the page to look alive. And because of that, we decided to um, use this element of typing text and um, like chat boxes like fading in and out to make the page more dynamic and less static. So, and at the end of the story, we also still incorporated that um, element of the turning knob as a surprise to switch up the interactions. And so these are the four steps and I hope this walkthrough gave you a better idea of um, how steps one and two are typically, typically done in Conti. But um, here's the tricky part about thinking about reading experience. How you structure your story is essentially up to you and your creativity. There is no right or wrong answer. And this can sound pretty intimidating, especially if you are new to data stories. So for now, I shall be going through a few, a few um, layouts and structures to guide you guys on how you can come up with interesting structures. Okay, so how you structure your story will influence how long the reader is going to stay on the page. Because if your story is too long and too wordy, nobody's going to take the time to scroll all the way down, right? So you, ha you have to find a way to choose a structure that's going to keep them engaged while reading your story. So I'm going to introduce to you, uh, I just, maybe some of you know this already, but maybe you can reiterate this. Three types of layout that we use in Conti. Number one is the basic chronicle. Number two is the scrolly telly. I'm sure most of us are familiar with this. And number three is how we can add interactive sections to our story. So this is a basic chronicle. We call this the chronicle layout in Continentalist, which is something that is pretty easy to do. It's simply just stacking text blocks on top of one another. But the thing about stacking text blocks on top of one another, like in a Word document, is that it can get very wordy and it's like you're front-loading a lot of content to your user or your readers. So for a simple layout like this, typographic hierarchy is super, super important because it makes the text more readable and organized. So how do we do typographic hierarchy in Conti? Um, we carry a different font type and size to distinguish the headers from the pros. White space is so important. As you can see, that there's a lot of white space between the headers and the body pros. And we take the time to like do a horizontal offset that is significant enough so that people can see the different sections like main points, sub points in our story. Other than that, um, it's pretty simple to code and design. And this 
template is what you use is what you we would usually use if we want to create a very simple and fast data storytelling with just text and data visualization. To add more character in your visual breaks, um, what we do is to um, follow a visual metaphor according to the story. Um, the key to using the chronicle layout is to utilize appropriate visual breaks throughout the entire story. And here are a few ways that we've done it. Um, this is a piece about immigration detention in Hong Kong. And we designed the headers to have some kind of like barbed wires embellishment to fit the visual design and mirror its theme of incarceration. It's pretty simple. We just do it using pseudo elements before and after to the header text. And because the story is pretty heavy about immigration detention, um, we added sketch-like annotations in the paragraph to emphasize certain points. So it's as if we have passed the reader um, a physical copy of our story and they're using a highlighter or like a pen to highlight important points as they go through the story. And it helps them like pinpoint what are the main points that we want them to look out for when reading such a heavy piece. Visual breaks can be really fun and candid as well. You don't have to be really serious all the time. And this story is a story about the history of rubber in Singapore. And our designer wanted to try this parallax scrolling effect. So as you scroll down, you have a very retro looking car moving horizontally across the page. It's definitely additional work to design and code this parallax effect. And I was like, why must I code this parallax effect? It's extra work. But to my surprise, actually readers feedback that the parallax element brought out the character of the story. And to us, this intangible aspect um, adds on to the overall reading experience of the story. It's like, you know, you're reading something very vertical and suddenly something horizontal comes across. So it's sort of like, um, captures your attention again, just as maybe you are dozing off when reading the story. Number two is the scrolly tally. I'm sure a lot of you have come across scrolly tally um, out there. Many data journalism outfits also use this layout. So the scrolly tally is a scroll and tell. And you can see um, in this example, we have an illustration in the background. And as the text boxes um, goes into the page, the illustration changes. And this layout is really great if, let's say you have an illustration set that tells a story or a process. Imagine like you are telling the story of a bird hatching from an egg to a young bird to like an adult bird. So it's pretty useful to tell a process as the images in the background changes. In order to use a scrolly tally layout, um, you have to first understand how it works. So in every scrolly tally, there's two elements at play. Number one, we have a huge visual graphic, which is your sticky visual element. So this, in this example, is the illustration in the background. And the second element is your text boxes that the users can scroll through the page. So the concept is like as the user scrolls on the text box, right? The background image changes. It's very simple. So what I like about the scrolly tally is that it's not boring at all. It's really dynamic because when you scroll, something changes. But having too many text boxes can cause information fatigue. So when we use scrolly tally, what I like to tell my writers is like, can you don't give me too many text boxes? Because imagine if you are the reader, right? You read through the story, then you don't know when the text boxes is going to end. So the sweet spot about using scrolly tally text boxes is like just maybe six text boxes with um, accompaniment of a background graphic. You can use, oh my God, the pitch. Okay, never mind. Okay, so in a previous example, the scrolly tally is used with a background illustration. But in this example, you can pair the scrolly tally with a data viz. It's really versatile. And I like this because as the text um, goes into the page, right? The data viz on the right changes. And what I like about this layout as well is that this side-by-side -side layout gives the user the opportunity to scroll over the data visualization and hover any tooltips if there's any. So there's like changing, it, changing data visualization and also user exploration at the same time because it's a side-by-side -side layout. You can also pair scrolly tally with a map. So as you can see here, when the text box um, goes into the page, the map view changes. It's as if the location, it's as if the user is bringing you on a different journey by changing the map location from different places and highlighting different places that they want to highlight in the story. 
Which brings me to the third point, which is how do you add interactive sections to your data story? So um, interactive elements would transform a static page into something that captures the imagination of readers and holds their attention. And these are two ways that you can um, bring in interactive sections to your story. So number one, you can choose to bring your reader on a journey. And number two, you can let the readers explore the story page on their own. So let's start with the first one. This is an example of how to bring your reader on a journey. And I really like this piece because it was one of the first pieces that I worked with maps. Um, the concept was to follow the journey of the spoonbill sandpiper from where it from its breeding grounds in Russia and how it migrated over to Sonadia Island in Bangladesh. So imagine Russia is like way at the top here, right? And then you are going down all the way to Bangladesh. So what we did was to draw a purple line that traces the approximate route um, following the journey of the bird as it passes through places like the Jiangsu coast of the Yellow Sea in China and Northern Vietnam. Tying the scrolly tally to um, the map is also means that as the user scrolls, the purple line also um, draws proportionately to how much the user has scrolled. So it's as if you are controlling the journey of the bird as you are scrolling down the story. So you can check this um, method out in the actual story online, but I hope that I, I've done some justice trying to explain how the scrolly works in bringing the user on a journey here. And the last point is about letting your users choose their own or letting your users choose their journey or let it, letting them explore the story. Um, like Amanda mentioned, the Asian sci-fi story, we had a lot of content that we wanted to share with the readers. We had stories from the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, where is it? Singapore. But putting them together in like one entire chronicle would be super boring because like the readers would get very tired reading everything, right? So what we did was, we wanted to let them choose because if I'm a reader from Singapore, I probably like want to see works from my own country first before seeing works from other countries. So we added buttons like this one, which is like a crossroad for them in the story. So we let them choose um, which country they want to see first. And by clicking on the button, it shows the section of the story regarding um, relating to Singapore. For this reading experience to work, good signposting and instructions is a must because we don't want the users to like scroll past something that they can explore and then just continue reading through the story. So as you can see, we have like a different layout for when the users can click on something. And this is well thought out by Amanda whose um, expertise is in user experience and design. And lastly, we have a data visualization that has a lot of spatial data. This is a map about wild otter seizures and trade routes. When working with large data sets like this, most of the time, I can't show everything on the map because then it will be like cluttered with so many dots and lines. So I can only show a certain view by filtering the data at any one time. Um, for this to work, what we did was to add in um, user inputs like switches, sliders, buttons, and hover actions. We can view the data by species of authors and when the seizures occur. And in another view on the same map, we can also view like the routes um, that the wild authors trait did occur. To take it up a notch further, we can also think about like how to use click events or hover events on the map. What happens if you were to hover on the bubble versus what happens if you were to click on the bubble? Would a pop-up appear or would a dialog box appear? So these are user interactions that we have to think about in order to let the user explore huge data sets like this. And with that, here's a summary of the key points that we just covered in this section about layout and user experience. There were three main layouts that we covered, the chronicle, the scrolly tally, and interactive sections. When all that's said and done, the key takeaway for the story layout that I want you to remember is that the layout will influence the user experience and people remember how they feel when they're reading the story and how they experience when just scrolling through the story. Okay, let's put whatever that I've said into a practice. We're going to dissect a story that we've done in Conte. It's about wet markets in Singapore. So on the screen here, I have a QR code for you to scan. And it's a story that we did. Um, it's posted on continentalist.com. So what I need you to do is very simple. You just scan the story. 
and then read through the story and I need you to spot what are the different story layouts that we have used. For example, did we use like, did we use a scroll yet first? Did we use a good visual break? So on and so forth. And we can like discuss this afterwards. I'll just walk through the story on the screen and we can talk about the story layouts, okay? Okay, this introduction of the story talks about the wet market experience in the Singapore. So we wanted to show nostalgia, memory, and sounds of the wet markets. And we also talked about the brief history of wet market, the definition and history of it in Singapore. And then we moved on to the next section about what the wet market is like by using illustrations. We explained a little bit about Singapore's urban planning history and why wet markets are well developed around the housing, the public housing areas. Um, in the next section, we talked about the floor plan and layout of the wet market because it's really big and we wanted to showcase how many different stalls there are in our wet market. Following that, we talked about how wet markets in a country like Singapore is unique because for some place that is so modern, something as old and a little bit wet, like a wet market in Singapore, doesn't really fit so well and why it still exists um, in modern Singapore today. We also have this um, trolley that suddenly randomly goes across the screen. Just a bit of context about the trolley. In Singapore, a lot of people use this. A lot of old aunties will use this trolley and then they'll just walk around carrying their groceries. And it's like a common thing that you see in Singapore. So we wanted to add this bit of nostalgia into the story. And we end the story with a call to action about why wet markets are worth keeping. And this is how we always try and add a call to action about, you know, since wet markets are disappearing, um, what can we do to keep the spirit alive? So I'll give you guys like maybe a minute to look through the story on your phone and maybe just shout out like what are the scrolly telly that you see or what you think has done well for this story. Oh no, it gives an error, it's not opening. Okay, so um, for those of you who can't open the story, maybe you can go to continentalist.com and then search for PASA, what makes the story unique. Sorry about that, we tested the QR code yesterday and we could access the story from our hotel. <laughs> Okay, does anybody want to share like what layouts they found in the story? Like, I know there's a lot of scrolly, but what was the scrolly paired with? Okay, I will walk through the story, okay? <laughs> okay, so the first part, we tried to pair the scrolly with a moving background video because we wanted to capture the vibrancy of the wet market. And as you scroll, actually it triggers the audio background with the ambient sound of the Singapore wet market. It's a really bustly, very loud sound and it's optional for people who don't want to hear the sound. And then we moved on to a second scrolly where we added an illustration with text boxes to talk about like the history of wet markets in Singapore. And then we move on to a third scrolly where we paired the scrolly with a map. This scrolly with a map shows the locations of the wet market as well as its proximity to the housing areas in Singapore and why they are located. So we also added this interactive section where users are able to explore the map and like click around um, before they move on to the next section of the story. The next part is a chronicle layout where we try and interlace the prose with a lot of data visualizations and headers. And we added a visual break, which is this rare, um, which is the um, trolley that you see at the bottom here. 
our designer wanted to add like flying plastic bags and um, trolley just to signify like, you know, these are the atmospheres and things that you see in a wet market. And finally, we also wanted to create this recipe for people to see um, what they can actually make from things that they find from the wet market. But we did it in a graphic card format um, inspired by one of our local influencers. Um, I think she's like a very popular cook and we took this, um, we partnered with her to get this recipe together. Now that we've taken a look at the different ways that you can structure the story, Amanda is going to talk more about the visual design and how to make it more interesting. Okay, so um, now let's delve a bit deeper into the visual design of the story. Um, so this is where we start to use colors, typography, images to just add more interactivity and more dynamism into the design so starting so when you design a story you have to start off with visual research so visual research is very important because it is essentially scouring for inspiration be it print web or you know magazine posters album covers so what i did here was to find visual references for the science fiction story and what i found was that there were mainly two concepts Retrofuturism and cyberpunk. So it is these two um, visual languages have been used so common that just by looking at the colors, the typography, the imagery, you can immediately associate it with science fiction. And that is good because you want our visuals to match the story that we're talking about. So in the end, I just decided to try retrofuturism because it was um, a concept I was interested to try. And after we have done our visual research, the next step is to ideate. So this is where you start to plan the different um, components, such as typography and your illustration notes. So as you can see over here, I tried to use a white font to uh, match the retrofuturism vibe. And also, these are some of the references and notes that our illustrator wrote. Um, she made a specific note about how to incorporate mystical and traditional elements into the story and her drawings because myths and legends are often intertwined with um, Southeast Asian science fiction. And not forgetting one of the most, most important components, your color palette. So your color palette is super important because um, it sets the visual mood of your story. You know, just like how if a website is dark, it tends to feel more somber. If a website is bright and colorful, it feels more lighthearted, more playful. So this is really important in design in general, but also in data stories. Because picking the right colors will allow your data and story to be interpreted correctly. But what is it about colors that enable us to do this? So we will be looking at it in three different aspects. The first one is how colors evoke emotions. So just a trigger warning, um, before I show you the example, this is a story we did on sexual violence. Um, there are no graphic images, don't worry. It's just the topic itself. So I'll move on to it. So... On the left, it is a tree map about where sexual violence has occurred in Singapore. And on the right, it is a visualization showing the proportion of victims whose perpetrators were people they knew and trusted. So let's take a few seconds to just process this visualization. How did you feel when you look at this? Did your heart feel heavy? Were you angry? Would you have felt the same if this was presented in a multicolored bar chart? So why did we feel the way we did? It's because co every color elicits an emotional response. So in the example just now, red and black signal violence and maybe your mind relates it to fear. And this feeling that you felt was what made the story very compelling because without emotion, your story will not be relatable. And if people cannot relate to a story, they cannot care about it. So emotion is very important because it can even be a driving force for change. And the next thing that colors can do is to create associations to help us um, interpret data better, uh, data and stories better. So all of us associate topics and concepts with color. And these associations can make your story and design more memorable and understandable. 
So what I mean by this is this example over here, um, we wrote a story about queuing in Singapore. So people love to queue in Singapore. It's quite a quirk. Um, it's common to just join a queue even before you know what it is for. So we decided to dedicate this story to the love of queuing. And as you can see, we used a pink and red color palette to symbolize love. Yeah, so this is how you can match it to cultural associations. And the last thing is to highlight important messages. So when it comes to picking your color palette, you don't always have to choose something bright and flamboyant in order for it to be attractive. Sometimes just using the right amount of color can be equally effective as well because you allow your audience to focus exactly on what you want them to focus on. So yeah, sorry, forgot to change the slide, but yeah, you can guide your audience through the story. So this is an example we did on rare earth elements and how it is harming vulnerable communities in Myanmar. So this story is really simple. It just uses muted browns and greens with pops of red. And the red um, is used to highlight certain text and key visual elements that we wanted the user to focus on. So in today's world where people's attention spans are getting shorter, um, this technique is really good if you want to give uh, your audience the option of just skimming through the story while still be able to grasp, grasp the main points. And beyond visual design, like color and text and typography, we can also consider alternative formats to convey our story because sometimes the best way to really engage your audience and convey what you're trying to say may not be in prose. So comics was something that we started exploring uh, late last year. We felt that this was a good way to convey stories that were a bit more approachable and personal as it was telling the story from the viewpoint of the character. So in this story, um, it's on Deepa Valley, which is called the Festival of Lights. It's celebrated in Singapore. We followed the journey of two young siblings as they go around um, making Deepa Valley's treats and snacks um, in preparation for the celebration. So the data here was actually how to make the snacks and we did it in a comic form. So besides comics, um, illustrations are also another way to depict things because um, the thing about illustrations is that they have this ability to convey things in both a metaphorical or realistic manner. And this can be really useful. Um, so in this example, um, it covers, it, it was a story about hepatitis C uh, and how it's harming, how refugees in Bangladesh um, struggle to get help with this disease. So it shows you a map of the nearest clinic to the refugee camp. It is a 40 minute a 40 minute journey by foot really far. It shows you the route they have to take as well as some of the dangers they face such as landslides, heavy rains on a steep mountain, which makes it very difficult for them to go to the clinic and for help to get to them. So illustrations are a way to convey emotional impact as well. And this is really important for us at Conti. Um, besides comics and illustrations, we can also use multimedia as a means to engage your audience in the experience. So this is a story about Rohingya refugees, and it uses a video clip um, about the ocean to show the precarious situation that these refugees have to go through. And as you scroll, a, a black gradient fills up the screen to mimic that um, image of the boat capsizing, capsizing. And this is a danger that the refugees have to face when they go on this journey. So when you use video clips or multimedia like this, you can actually create um, empathy in your story because now with this, you are in a better position to understand what these people are going through. And last but not least, um, audio. So sometimes information doesn't always have to be textual or visual. They can be auditory as well. So before people learn to read and write, um, stories were passed through generations orally. And taking on that spirit, interview snippets and voice recordings are, in, are good ways for storytelling because not only do they provide a more qualitative rigor to the story, they also create a more intimate experience. So in this same story about the Rohingya refugees, we included an audio clip of um, the refugees sharing their personal experience and journey. And when you hear their voice telling you their story, 
at the back of your mind, you imagine a person and you feel more connected to them. Yeah. So besides um, oral storytelling, inline audio is also another thing that we can use. Um, this is something that uh, continent, it's super helpful for continentalists like because we use we tell stories about Asia and not every data set we have is in English. So sometimes using um, untranslated terms or having inline audio can be helpful in preserving the authenticity of the word. Yeah. So in this story on the left, um, it's the Deepa Valley story. There are different ways you can say the Deepavali greetings, and we felt that on top of the Romanized spelling, it would be nice to get an idea of how it actually sounds. So we added the inline audio for that. And on the right, it is a story about Han Chinese names, about how Chinese names have evolved over, I think, six decades. So it shows you how the common characters or words and names are pronounced. And you know how a Mandarin is a tonal language. So even though it is spelled the same, the way you say it can change its meaning totally. So inline audio was very important for the Han Chinese name story. And with that, this is a summary of the key points we have covered in this section on visual design. So the first thing is your visual research. Um, be thoughtful about your choice of color as well. And if possible, try to consider alternative formats besides prose. Yeah, I see people taking pictures. Okay, ready? Okay, and now to test who has been sleeping, we're gonna do a pop quiz. <laughs> okay, don't worry, it's really easy. It's just five true or false questions. And once again, you can join me on Slido. Just scan the QR code or go to slido.com and key in the event code, Conti. Yeah, so. For this, there are, you have 15 questions to, you have 15 seconds to answer each question and the fastest fingers will win. There is a leaderboard, so we know who's the best of the best, okay? Is everybody ready? No, no, okay. <laughs> we might have a prize also, so try your best. <laughs> Is everybody in or are there people who are still trying to join? Still trying? Okay. Ready? Ready? Shall we start? Okay, let's go, Aisha. First question, data stories can only be visible, true or false? What? Uh, maybe. <laughs> we do have things to give out actually. Yeah, so if you stay to the end. Okay, and the answer for this is false. Okay, 13 people, who are you? Own up. <laughs> Okay, next question. Um, oh, it's loading. Okay. Yay, I who's I stand number one. Keep it up. Okay. Next question. Without the right colors, it can be difficult for your audience to em to be emotionally connected to the story. True or false? Okay, nice. Nice, okay, okay. Leaderboard is slowly changing. Multimedia elements can help your audience empathize with the characters in your story. True or false? Okay, seems like most people were awake. Um, let's go on to question four. Aha, uh -huh, Neil, you moved up to number two. 
The mood board helps you identify potential concepts, colors, and typography for your story. Okay. <gasps> it changed. L. <laughs> okay. Number five. Colors are secondary to your story design. Something to think about only if you have time. True or false? Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. Let's see the leaderboard. Oh, 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 it's so exciting. Okay. Let's move on. We have one last bonus question. What visual element is present in the Continentalist logo? Let's go. <laughs> Not, uh... Oh, wow. That's a bit disappointing. That is very disappointing. The correct answer is bridge and tortoise. <laughs> okay. okay, so yay. Um, Number one is L. Is L here physically present in this room? Okay, hi. Um, Come see us later. We have something for you. <laughs> okay. Nice. Okay. Ready? Okay, let's move on to the next section. So once you have your story outline and a rough design concept, this is the part where you move on to the last step of the process, which is to prepare your visualization so that they can be presented to the world. And this is what this section is about. It's about giving you guys some tips and tricks to visualize your data well. And for this workshop, we have summarized it into a four-step process. The first step is to choose the right visualization. So essentially, data visualization is about encoding information. You are translating data into something visual through the use of visual elements. So these elements can be things like shape, length, angle. They just have to be things that our eyes can perceive and differentiate. And when you pair different encodings together, it can actually give rise to very unique and interesting data visualizations. So we'll be going through a few examples to show how this is manifested. So the first one, really simple, your classic bar chart. When you put um, categories along the x-axis, you're using position and the quantitative data is represented by length. But it can also get a bit more complex like this. So this was a project we did for climate data. So let's go from top down. The first one, the circles, they use size and color. That is rainfall data. The bigger the circle, the more rainfall there is. And we also categorized rainfall into different categories. So zero to 50 mm, 51 to 100 mm, and depending on which group um, the rainfall data falls under, the color of the green um, increases, it, it gets darker. And then when we go on to the second one, which is length and color, this is about um, heat index. So the, the longer the length, the hotter the heat index. And it you can really see on the screen, but it follows um, a color gradient from bright red to dark brown. And depending on the value of it, the color of it changes. The third one is height plus fill plus color. So um, if you see the leaf shape thing, the entire leaf shape represents 365 days. And the shaded area um, represents the number of dangerous days that are in that year. So dangerous days here refer to, I think, days above 40 degrees Celsius. They consider that a dangerous day. So um, if you look at the visualization, if it's yellow, it means that there are less than 100 dangerous days that year. And if it's red, there were more than 100 dangerous days that year. And for color, it was just um, annual temperature. So we had a full data set a range data set, maybe 25 degrees to 40 degrees. And depending on the annual temperature, the color would adjust accordingly. So you can see from these examples how playing with different encodings can actually give rise to very unique um, visualizations. But what happens when we don't choose the right visualization? So in this example, um, it's by Channel News Asia. It's talking about the COVID-19 cases in Singapore, I think in, I think in 2021. 
So if you look over here, they have two data sets, new cases confirmed and patients discharged. But when you look at this, you realize that it's really overwhelming and difficult to read, right? So do you guys have any thoughts on why you are feeling a bit overwhelmed by this? Maybe you can just shout it out. There's a lot of lines. Yeah. Anything else? Colors? Too many. Sorry? Small numbers. Yes. Right. So there are quite a number of things going on here. The first thing is that there are two data sets, new cases and patients discharged. And because the trends of these two are very different, putting them together on the same chart makes it very difficult to understand what is it trying to say. Is there a pattern we're supposed to see? Uh, what are we supposed to actually like get from this? What is the insight? We don't know. And because the bars are so thin and there's so many small numbers, it feels very cramped and overwhelming and your eyes don't really know where to look at. So um, how would we change this? And an analytics blog actually redid the visualization for this. They changed it into a line chart, cleaned up the design and the axis. And right away, you can understand it so much better. You can tell that the number of new cases are going up while less patients are getting discharged. So this is why choosing, just by choosing the correct visualization, it can drastically change the legibility of your data. So at Continentalist, for data stories, we believe that we should just stick to one message for each visualization. Whether, are you trying to document numbers or are you trying to compare two data sets? And depending on what is your intention, you would choose your type of visualization accordingly. So the next step is to title your visualization. This sounds simple, but the most common mistake is that when you generate a chart on maybe Excel, you leave the default title like this, like rain in MM against month. While this is not wrong, it's not written in a way that is meaningful. So how would we change this? It, once again, depends on the message you're trying to say. So because we believe that a good title would frame the data and it wouldn't just list the axis. And what I mean by this is this. So for example, if your intention is to just show the overview of rainfall, you can just write overview of rainfall. But if your intention is to show an insight, for example, the driest month, then you should reflect that in your title. So doing it this way and framing it according to what you are trying to say will make it more intuitive for your reader to understand and they would know immediately what to focus on. For example, in the second one, they would just focus their eyes on February. Yeah. So, and then the third one is to color it right. So this is another segment on color, but focused on data. Um, so the first kind of data we have is data that progresses from low to high. Um, and when you have a data like this, you should use a color gradient. So um, it's good to know that intuitively low col light colors are used to represent low values and dark colors are used to represent dark high values. So we should stick to this convention in order to prevent um, misinterpretation or misreading of the data. The next kind of continuous data we have is sequential scale. So when your data is diverging, for example, um, the blue means that there was an increase in population and the red means there was a decrease in population. So when you have data sets like that, you should use diverging colors, but your color intensities have to be consistent. For example, your negative 10 in the red have to be the same shade as same level of lightness as the plus 10 in the blue. Otherwise, it becomes very confusing and you can't really judge it accurately. The next kind of color we have is categorical data. I think this one is the simplest. It's just distinct colors for each category that you have. But the thing to note is if there are more than seven categories, it's best to just color them all the same instead of trying to color code it because there are only so many colors that your eyes can clearly distinguish. And when you have more than seven colors, the chances are the colors you pick will be too similar and it might cause some misinterpretation of the data. For example, if you have like a magenta and a red, and some, some people's eyes may not differentiate it properly, or if you're on a screen like that, maybe your colors don't appear as well. So this is, a, this is an important point to take note of. And adding on to color coding categories, it's also important to be consistent. So for example, if 
if you look at this um, example, the US is always coded in blue and China is always colored as black. So this is great because if, as you are transiting from one visualization to another, your audience doesn't have to relearn the legend. They can immediately know what to look at and understand it intuitively and they won't misread it also. So this is another important point. And when we talk about data visualizations and color, we should also be aware of color accessibility. So it's easy to brush um, this section off by saying, you know, like how many people in the world are actually colorblind? We don't have to care about it. But well, if we rethink it as universal design and we aim to achieve it every time we create a data visualization, we can allow data to be more inclusive to different people around the world. And I think this inclusivity for data is really important. So um, because this chapter is on color, we're just going to talk about color accessibility. So this is an overview of what colors might look like to different people with color vision deficiencies. Um, that's the original. And depending on the kind of condition they have, the color they see looks different. So if you look at the first two columns, you realize that the colors are mostly just reduced to yellow and blue. And this can be problematic if you choose to use co only color to encode your data, because not everybody might be able to perceive that accurately. But there are instances where, let's say you work for a company and they have a set brand color. So how do you mitigate this? You guys have answers? Like let's say if my brand color is um, blue and red and it's not accessible, but you have to use the color in your visualization. So what are some tips that you think you can help to mitigate this issue? Any ideas? Yeah, right, patterns is one of them. Any other? Another thing you can add is to use symbols if it's, if it's applicable, symbols or patterns, or you could try to like tweak the color of the red and blue. Yeah, so um, moving on, I will be sharing some ways to ensure that your color palette is more accessible. So these are some common pairings to be careful of. Um, first, Pairing similar colors such as red and orange are not accessible and it's exemplified by this screen. It's red and orange, but you can't really tell because of the projection and it makes my point. Um, especially if they're also really small, like on a scatter plot, sometimes they're not the most visible and it can result in misreading of the data. So pairing similar colors is something to be careful of. The next one is pairing red and green. This is because um, red and green is the most common type of color vision deficiency. Um, and both colors will look like a murky brown to people with um, that version of color vision deficiency. So um, I would like to point out that pairing red and green is not a strict no-no. There are ways you can use it, but generally it's just good to remember or be aware that this pairing can be problematic. Um, another thing, another tip is to include a mix of light and dark colors in your visualization. So when all the colors are of the same intensity or brightness, they can be very uncomfortable to look at, especially if they are like neon, they can be triggering for people with epilepsy. Um, also, if you convert the chart to black and white, let's say you are in a corporate setting and you need to print it out for your bosses, you only have black and white ink and you print it out but they will look the same. So it's important to have a mix of light and dark colors to have that varied um, intensities. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the main takeaway is to not let information become inaccessible just because of your poor color choice. And now we are down to the last step, which is to experiment visually. So this is actually my favorite step. Um, it's super fun. So when you have, a good understanding of visual encoding, this is where you can start to experiment with your visual language and the style to make it match your story better. So on the top, top left, um, we wrote a story about beauty pageant speeches and what are the most common words that these beauty pageant contestants would say. For example, things like world peace, love, and things like that. So it was actually just a bar chart, but we saw the potential to change it into a tiara. 
to fit the concept better. Yeah. And the one below, it is the Han Chinese names again. So um, we took inspiration from the Chinese chessboard and we aligned it in that grid. And the higher you go, it means the more common that character is. And on the right, um, that curved circle, um, it's a reflection of what you would actually see in the Hajj pilgrimage where people would line up and then they'll do a mass prayer together. So it's like a reflection. Yeah. So um, yeah. So you can do this once you have a good understanding of your visual encoding and you can start to play around and make sure that it matches your story better. And this is a checklist for the data visualization design. Um, the first one, you have to check if your visualizations are understandable. So this means choosing the right visualization. The second one are colors. Do your colors make sense with the type of data that you have and are they accessible? The third one, um, do your visualizations make sense in the sense of in the context of your story? So this means your titling, um, making sure that your data actually means something and it's not included just for the fun of it. So um, I hope that what I've shared so far is um, meaningful and you guys had some takeaways from it. At the end of the day, I think when it comes to story design, the most important thing we want to do is to humanize the data because data can seem very distant and sterile. And sometimes we forget that data is about real people and real experiences. So we need to make sure that um, we also consider the emotional aspect of data stories. And when your audience is reading your data story, they don't just remember the statistics that you use. They remember the emotions and the experience that you gave them. And hopefully with that emotion and experience, they will remember it and carry on to make improvements in their lives and make the world a better place. So um, with that, we have come to the end of Data Storytelling Workshop. Um, thank you for spending time with us again. Um, and in case you missed our talk yesterday, this is something we do on our Instagram. Um, we have this series called the Data Deep Dive where we do... Um, it's a data literacy series, and we delve into topics like um, basic statistics, data collection, um, what are some things to look out for when doing analysis. Um, we also have a newsletter called Notes from the Equator because we are right smack on the equator. Um, we put in a lot of effort for this, and we share some of our um, behind the scenes experiences, processes, and we also share um, stories around the region that we feel inspired by. And finally, you can follow us on our socials.